The peace of Christ be with you all. Take a minute to stand and greet those around you. Introduce yourselves and uh, share God's peace. One day some guys came up to Jesus and they said, or Jesus' disciples rather, and they said, uh, sirs, we would like to see Jesus. And when you think about it, that's why we're all here. We want to see Jesus. Maybe you don't realize it's Jesus that you want to see, but we come here looking for the things that Jesus gives us. We come looking for answers, for meaning, for acceptance, for forgiveness, for peace. We come looking for the things that Jesus came to offer to us. And when we see Jesus, we see nothing less than God himself. Scripture says that Jesus mirrors the very being of God. And we're in luck because Jesus said that where even two or three of us come together in his name, he will be here. So we're going to trust and believe that that is true this morning. And we're going to pray that before we leave here today, we will have caught at least a glimpse of the one who came to give us life in all its fullness. So let's worship God together. Our opening hymn today is number 341. If you want to use your hymn book, uh, the words will be on the screen, Fairest Lord Jesus.
Let us pray. God, we pray that you would keep before our minds and hearts the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who when he was on earth found refreshment and strength in doing the will of you who sent him and in finishing your work. In the midst of all the busyness and stress of daily life, when it's sometimes hard to find even a moment's quietness, give us grace to remember Jesus who was never, never impatient and never overwhelmed, but kept communion with you in the midst of all that he did. During this time of worship, may we be united with him and through him united with you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated and I'll invite the children to come to the front. Join us. <laughs> it's a long way. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you all today? Great to see you here. Um, I need uh, three volunteers. One, two, three. Come on up here. Now, what I'm going to do is I want you to stand in a, in a row. That's fine. And uh, I'm going to uh, whisper a, a message to you, and then you're going to whisper it to the next person, and you're going to whisper it to the next person, okay? Can we do that? Okay. God is love. Okay? Well... Who, where did the message come from? It came from me. <laughs> what? <laughs> but how did everybody else hear the message? It came from you, right? That's kind of, you can sit down, thank you. That's kind of what God does. The message we want to hear comes from God, but God tells it to us through other people. And a lot of those people are the people we hear from in the book called the Bible. Does anybody know the name of somebody who wrote part of the Bible? Anybody think of the name of anybody that maybe wrote one of the books in the Bible? Well, there's King David, who doesn't have a book named after him, but he wrote uh, some of the songs in the Bible called the Psalms. And then there are four books that tell us about Jesus that are called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are called Gospels. It's God speaking to us, but it's God speaking to us through them. And that's what the Bible is. So we can trust that when we read the Bible, even though you know, we're not kind of hearing maybe a voice in our head. We're hearing from God because we're hearing the people that God uh, asked to give us that message. And that's what happens when we read the Bible. And we're going to sing, excuse me, we're going to sing a, a favorite old hymn that has that message, which is, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? For the Bible tells me so. Okay, so let's sing that together. You can look at the words on the screen if you're able to read them.
say a prayer, and then we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the people through whom you speak to us, especially those who wrote the Bible and who speak to us through the Bible. We pray that you'll help us to hear their message to us because it's really your message. And hear us now as we share in the prayer that Jesus taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, you're going to go with uh, Mrs. King down this way, and uh, the teens are going to uh, meet with uh, Sue Edwards in the kitchen. So we'll see you all after church.
Our first scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Hebrews, reading from chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Long ago, God spoke in many different ways to our fathers through the prophets, telling them little by little about his plans. But now in these days, he has spoken to us through his Son, to whom he has given everything, and through him he made the world and everything there is. God's Son shines out with God's glory, and all that God's Son is and does marks him as God. He regulates the universe by the mighty power of his command. He is the one who died to cleanse us and clear our record of all sin, and then sat down in highest honor beside the great God of heaven. Thus he became far greater than the angels, as proved by the fact that his name, Son of God, which was passed on to him from his Father, is far greater than the names and titles of the angels. Our second reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. And I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne, a scroll with writing on the inside and on the back, and sealed with seven seals. A mighty angel with a loud voice was shouting out this question. Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and to unroll it? But no one in all heaven or earth or from among the dead was permitted to open and read it. Then I wept because no one anywhere was worthy. No one could tell us what it said. But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop crying, for look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered and proved himself worthy to open the scroll and to break its seven seals. I looked and saw a lamb standing there before the 24 elders in front of the throne and the living beings. And on the lamb were wounds that once had caused his death. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God, sent out into every part of the world. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting upon the throne. And as he took the scroll, the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each with a harp and golden vials filled with incense, the prayers of God's people. They were singing to him a new song with these words, You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it, for you were slain, and your blood has bought people from every nation as gifts for God. And you have gathered them into a kingdom and made them priests of our gods, and they shall reign upon the earth. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Open and enlighten our minds that we may understand your word, and having understood it, fashion our lives according to it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I'm just going to remind you that uh, we've invited you to uh, think, of, think about two questions during the sermon time. What is God saying to me, and what am I going to do about it? So I invite you to be open to the possibility that there's a word here for you and that out of that, uh, something different will, something about your life will be different. It doesn't have to be a huge change, but 
uh, we come to the Word hoping and trusting that God will say something to us that will um, uh, bring about change in our lives and bring us closer to God. So keep those questions in mind uh, during the sermon time. Uh, back in 1981, President Reagan's Secretary of the Interior was notoriously quoted as saying that it wasn't necessary to take any steps to protect the environment because Jesus was coming back soon. Uh, what's the point, he said, of uh, trying to save the oceans and the trees if the Lord is going to return, if we're living in the end times and it's all going to be swept away anyway? A uh, hundred or two hundred years ago in villages and towns in countries like Poland or Russia or Hungary, uh, marauding bands of Christians would rampage through Jewish neighborhoods on Good Friday, beating and burning and murdering, they said, in retaliation for the Jews killing Christ. The apartheid system in South Africa for many years, which privileged whites and oppressed blacks, was very much supported by the Dutch Reformed Church. The church gave it its theological underpinnings by teaching that it was God's will that the races be separate and that white Christians should rule. In Oxford County, where my family and I used to live, there was an outbreak of polio a few years ago. Now, how in the world did a disease that we thought was wiped out 50 or 60 years ago make a comeback? Well, there's a conservative Christian sect that believes that vaccinating their children is contrary to the will of God. Now, what do all of these incidents, these stories have in common? Well, what they have in common is that the people involved in them all fervently believed that what they were doing is what God commanded them to do in the Bible. Last week, we asked the question, how can we hear God speaking to us? And we suggested that one of the most important ways is through the Bible. The Bible tells the story of God's dealings with the people of Israel and with the first Christians, but it's a living word that continues to speak to us today. And yet we know that people have used the Bible to justify some pretty terrible things. Slavery, war, the destruction of whole cultures. How do we know when we hear the Bible that what we are hearing in it is the voice of God? How do we know that we are reading the Bible the right way? About 40 years ago, there was a film made in Cuba called The Last Supper. This film was about a slave plantation in the 1700s. The plantation owner considered himself a humane and enlightened man, and he decided that he would teach his slaves about Jesus by reenacting the story of the Last Supper. And so he chose 12 slaves to sit at his table, representing the 12 apostles. And uh, he, the slave owner, took the role of Christ. And so he went around uh, washing his startled slaves' feet, and uh, he gave them food to eat and wine to drink. And he said to them, this is how much your Savior has loved you, that he was willing to bend down and wash your feet, that he was willing to give his life for you on the cross. Are you not thankful? As Jesus humbled himself to serve you, so you should imitate Jesus and be humble and obedient slaves. And he promised to give them the day off on Good Friday so that they could ponder the goodness of the Lord. The problem was, well, there are two problems. First of all, the slaves took the story too seriously. They really did believe that Jesus was their Savior and that they should honor him by not working on Good Friday. But the second problem is the plantation owner forgot to tell the cruel overseer, Don Manuel, who refused to allow them the time off. So the, fury, so the angry slaves rose up and they killed Don Manuel. Well, the plantation owner was furious. He tracked them all down, the slaves who a few hours before had sat at his table and shared his food and whose feet he had washed, and he had them all put to death. And then he vowed to build a beautiful new church in memory of Don Manuel. Well, this film is heavy with irony. The slave owner used the biblical story not as a way of bringing freedom to his slaves, but a way of trying to keep them docile and obedient. We can all read the Bible 
learn the stories of the Bible, speak the language of the Bible, but that's no guarantee that what we will hear in it is the voice of God. You know, we take a big risk every time we open that book, every time we open the Bible. That risk is that we must interpret it. When we read the Bible, we are always interpreting it. We can't help it. Whenever you take anything that was written in the past and you connect it to the present, you have to interpret it. When Jesus preached to the crowds in Galilee, or St. Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome, in order for that to be meaningful to us, we have to go through a process of interpretation. We have to say, what is it about that situation that sheds light on our situation? What is the point of contact between first century Galilee or Rome and 21st century St. Catharines? I remember when I was a student getting stuck at my door with a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses. I tried with all of my persuasive powers to convince them that the way they were reading the Bible was an interpretation, just like the way I was reading the Bible was an interpretation, but they were having none of it. Oh no, they said, we don't interpret the Bible, we simply read what is plainly on the page for all to see. But of course, that's not the truth. It's human nature to want to interpret the Bible in a way that works to our benefit. It's natural to read the Bible in such a way that at the end of it, we feel good and justified about ourselves. It's the easiest thing in the world to find confirmation in the Bible of what we want to believe. Just like the Bible provides a safeguard against thinking that our own subjective feelings and ideas are the voice of God, so we need some safeguard against finding in the Bible only what we want to find. And that safeguard I want to suggest to you is Jesus, that Jesus is the lens through which we as Christians read the Bible. Jesus gives us the eyes to see the truth that is in the Bible. Whenever we read the Bible, we need to ask if our reading is consistent with what we know of Jesus. Whenever we turn to the Bible for guidance, we have to ask, is it leading us in Jesus' way or in some different way? And if what we find in the Bible doesn't sound at all like Jesus, then we have to ask whether maybe we're not on the wrong track. We call the Bible God's Word, but it's really Jesus who is the Word of God. It is Jesus who tells us who God is and what God is like. St. John said that Jesus is more than just a wise and good teacher. He is actually the Word of God made flesh, come to dwell among us, literally to pitch His tent among us. And when Jesus came into the world, God came into the world in human form. God pitched his tent among us. For Christians, all Scripture is about Jesus. All Scripture is about Jesus. That's a hard thing to grasp because so much of the Bible doesn't seem to have anything to do with Jesus. The first part of our Bible, which Jews call the Tanakh and we call the Old Testament, was written hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. So how can it be about Jesus? And yet the first Christians had this insight, this intuition, this belief that all Scripture in one way or another points to Jesus and prepares the way for Jesus. The prophets of the Old Testament were not only speaking about the current events of their time, although they were doing that, they were also pointing to the one who was yet to come. And who is Jesus? Well, the Scriptures tell us who He is. Jesus is the one who brings the kingdom of God into our midst. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said that He was anointed to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to announce that the time had come when God would save His people. He brought the kingdom, the rule of God among us. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was innocent, but He gave His life for the guilty. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He came to make peace between a holy God and sinful humanity. Jesus defeated the power of death and gives us a hope in unshakable, unbreakable life. 
Jesus will come again, which means that the future is secure in God's hands. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. When we were far from God, God came near to us. When we were lost, God found us. When we were dead, God made us alive. The Bible is a huge book, actually a collection of books, 66 in all. Uh, its scope is vast, its variety mind-boggling, and yet I think we could sum the entire Bible up in one word, grace, grace. The word grace means gift. It means that what we cannot earn, God gives us. What, we, what couldn't be bought for all the money in the world, God offers to us free of charge. What we can't do for ourselves, God does for us. That's grace. One of my favorite definitions of grace is when we get what we don't deserve and when we don't get what we do deserve. What we don't deserve is God's acceptance, but we get it anyway. We, what we do deserve is God's judgment, but that's not what we get. Grace is God's love freely given. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. And no, ma ba no matter how badly we mess things up, we can't lose it. Grace is what God has done for us apart from whatever we do for God. Grace is good news, the best news ever. Jesus didn't just tell us about God's grace. He showed it to us. He embodied it for us. Bill read for us this morning the opening verses of the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews is a very complicated book, and yet its message, I think, is quite simple. Jesus is the key to hearing God, to knowing God. I'm going to read those verses from the version of the Bible called The Message, which says, Going through a long line of prophets, God has been addressing our ancestors in different ways for centuries. It's not like God hasn't been speaking. God has always spoken through all kinds of people in all sorts of situations for a long, long time. God has not been silent. But it says, recently, he has spoken to us directly through his son. You know, we're kind of thick, we human beings. We just don't get it. We need to be told things over and over and over again. Uh, and God just has to keep repeating the message. And when we don't get it, God has to try a different way. God has not only spoken indirectly through prophets, God has now spoken directly face to face through Jesus. Rather than just sending messengers, the message himself has come to dwell among us. Frederick Beekner puts it this way, God never seems to weary of trying to get himself across. Word after word, he tries in search of the right word. God speaks through creation. God spoke through Noah and Moses and David and John the Baptist. But none of those media got the message across fully or adequately, so God spoke once more through his very own son, Jesus. Jesus is God's right word. The son perfectly mirrors God, Hebrews tells us, and is stamped with God's nature. In other words, when we see Jesus, we see God. Want to know what God is like? Turn to Jesus. Want to see the face of God? Look at Jesus. In our reading from Revelation, St. John is having these wild and crazy visions, and he sees a scroll containing the secret to the meaning of life and the destiny of the world. And I mean, who wouldn't want to know that, right? But it's a sealed scroll. It's shut up so that no one can read it. It's a closed book, and it doesn't appear as though there's anyone with the power to break the seals and open the book except one who is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, John looks for a lion. He looks around for a lion. But what does he see? He sees a lamb. A lamb bearing the marks of slaughter, it says. Not the king of beasts, but a helpless victim who gave his life in love. This loving lion lamb, Revelation says, holds the key to everything. And so we need Jesus to give us the key to the Bible. And to help us get the Bible right, or at least reduce the likelihood that we'll get it wrong, as we're so prone to do, 
Without Jesus, it's pretty well guaranteed that we will get it wrong most of the time. So every time we read the Bible, the one question we need to ask is, does this square with what we know of Jesus? You know, one of the most common Bible questions I get is, what about all those violent parts in the Bible? You know, those dreadful passages in the Old Testament where God commands Israel to obliterate another, another nation, wiping out every living soul. Someone said to me just last week that she has a really hard time reconciling the idea of a God of love with those bloodthirsty tales. What in the world kind of God would command such terrible things? There have been times in history where people have used those passages to justify what amount to acts of genocide. These days, those passages are more likely to drive people away from faith altogether. So what are they doing in the Bible? Well, one answer is that those stories are part of the history that leads up to Jesus. They prepare the historical ground for the coming of Jesus, but they cannot be a full and complete representation of the character of God in and of themselves. We can't take those stories as a sufficient straightforward face value depiction of who God is and what God wants. What those Old Testament stories do tell us is that God can give us victory over our enemies, but we need Jesus to tell us that our enemies are not flesh and blood, but spiritual forces of evil. And the only weapons that are effective against those enemies are Jesus' own weapons, prayer and self-giving love and faith. Even those disturbing passages of Scripture contain a kernel of truth, but we need Jesus to help us find out what that kernel is and not to go astray with them. We could give other examples. If the point you take from reading the Bible is that God is the way for you to get whatever you want out of life, then you're not reading the Bible through Jesus' eyes. There are lots of people who do believe that, that God's main purpose, God's job is to make them happy and give them whatever they want. But that's so contrary to what we know of Jesus. We know it can't be true. Jesus did not seek his own welfare above others, but poured himself out in love. Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve. Jesus warned against trying to acquire everything in the world at the cost of our souls. Jesus told us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness before all else. So whenever we read the Bible, we need to ask, what does this have to do with Jesus? Sometimes answering that question will be very difficult. We puzzle over parts of the Bible that don't seem to have much to do with Jesus at all. Sometimes, you know, I think we just kind of have to accept that and hope that things we don't yet understand now will one day become clear. But we have to remember that Jesus is a person. He's not entombed in ancient history. He's alive. He's alive in us through the Holy Spirit. He's alive among us through faith. And that means that our connection to Jesus is through a personal relationship. And personal relationships aren't static. They're dynamic, changing, growing, evolving. You're always learning new things about the person with whom you have a relationship. And so our relationship with Jesus never stands still. It's always changing and growing. And that means that Jesus is always helping us to hear Scripture in a new way. We go to Scripture to find Jesus, but as we come to know Jesus more intimately, He is teaching and reteaching us how to read Scripture. Jesus and Scripture work together in a gracious circle to bring us closer to God. One last word, we're not perfect. Our vision of God is always going to be partial and incomplete, like looking through a cracked and smudged pane of glass. A hundred years from now, people will be shaking their heads in disbelief at what we thought we could find in the Bible. We will never get to the place where we've got it all figured out. And so perhaps the most important thing we need to learn from Jesus is humility. Reading Scripture with Jesus' eyes means reading it with humility. Jesus is the one who humbled himself, taking the nature of a servant, 
And Jesus teaches us that we must always stand under the Word and not over it, letting it form and reform us, not the other way around. There's an old African story about a woman who read only her Bible. Her neighbors would say to her, you're always reading the Bible. You never read anything else. Aren't there any other books you could read? Aren't there lots of other books you could read? Oh yes, she said, but here's the thing. The Bible is the only book that reads me. And that's because of Jesus. Amen. Thanks be to God. Our next uh, hymn is number 661 in Voices United, or of course on the screen, Come to My Heart, Lord Jesus. Prayer is about turning to God, and we turn to God as we turn to Jesus. So we're going to begin our prayer time today by singing a beautiful old chorus, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
God, we pray for the grace to turn, to turn away from our own selfishness and sin and to turn towards you. Turn us away from thoughts, words, or actions that wound or reject others. Turn us away from that insatiable desire to have our own way, even if it clashes with yours. Turn us away from anger, malice, dissension, and strife. Turn us away from everything that separates us from you and from one another. God, hear us as we each confess to you the ways in which we have turned away. Help us not to turn away from our neighbor in need. Open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the cries of the hungry, the hurting, the lonely, the oppressed, whether they be in countries far away or right next door. God, hear us as we lift before you those we know who are in great need. Someone in our community has asked prayer for their sister-in-law who is undergoing chemotherapy. Someone has asked prayer for a young mother who is battling her third bout with cancer. Someone has asked prayer for their nephew who is struggling with depression. And someone has asked prayer for a friend who is having personal problems. God, help us to turn towards our responsibilities as your people. Turn us toward scripture and prayer. Turn us toward worship. Turn us toward the kind of community that breaks down barriers. Turn us toward faith and your power to work wonders. Hear us, Lord, as we pray for our church family and for your people everywhere. God, Scripture says that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. Drawing near to you, though, means drawing near to the one who is never far away. So, Lord, we pray that you would pour your Spirit into us, that we may know how near you are. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus set for us an example by giving his all in service to God. By faith, he empowers us to give sometimes to give more than we think we can. As we make our offering, let it be a sign of our willingness to give not just our money, but ourselves. Not just to pay the bills, but to serve God and others. Our offering will now be received.
Bountiful God, we come with our offerings in response to your love. With the new life in Christ, we give ourselves to, in service to others. With the energy bestowed by the Spirit, we seek to inflame all your people with a zeal for your way. Receive the work we do and the gifts we bring, that they may become a blessing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing song this morning is uh, Shine, Jesus, Shine, which is, uh, will be projected on the screen. Presence now scatter in Jesus' name. Go out from here, ready to see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and to let them see the face of Christ in you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and forever. Go in God's peace.